Atlas Tack of Fairhaven, Massachusetts, once boasted about the fact that it was the world's leading tack and small nail manufacturer. At one time, this huge facility employed over 350 workers, mostly from Fairhaven. In the late 1970s, the business began to slow down and much of its equipment was gradually sold or abandoned. In 1984, all signs of activity came to a standstill. The Atlas Tack has closed its doors, its machines silent forever. The stairway to the main office in front of the building once was full of administrators, secretaries, and bookkeepers going back and forth daily, helping to run the world's leading tack manufacturer. These tall windows once brought in generous amounts of light for the office staff, but now most of the offices are empty, except for a few file cabinets and litter thrown about the sturdy oak floors. High-ranking offices of the Atlas Tech Corporation probably entertain their guests and potential clients in this once stately room, which had its own elegant fireplace. As we go downstairs and pass through the 900-foot main corridor, we can see that time is quickly taking its toll on these old sturdy beams as they have rotted past the temporary 8 by 8 timbers to prevent this area from total collapse. The wooden floors have succumbed to plants and other moldy organisms that ironically add a touch of beauty. This section was the main area for manufacturing tacks and nails. Chemical corrosion has eaten away at the wooden walls that contain the pickling room where eyelets and tacks were soaked with various chemicals in these tanks. Railroad cars once loaded and dropped off their cargoes at doors like these on the north side of the building. In the stock room, much of the spare pots and supplies remain neatly in their shelves as other materials are strewn about the floors. It is believed that in the early 1980s many machines were crated up and sold to a company in Japan. However, in the machine shop most of the equipment remains. Some machines virtually stopped in the middle of a project and perhaps the few remaining employees were told to go home. The day they opened that building in 1901, they moved six skills from the place on Fort Street. And my mother was one of the six. And they said they had a ball in the shipping room, because that's before. And they said it was beautiful. Mr. Rogers had invited all the townspeople and his friends and everything. The purpose of that building, when Mr. Rogers built it, it was for the Fairhaven people. That's what he built it for. My husband and both my brothers worked there. My mother worked there before I was born. And uh, a lot of our family in the past years have worked there. So I went in the Atlas Tat looking for a job, and they offered me a job in there for 22 cents an hour. <laughs> and I went in there. I thought it was great because I didn't have to work Saturdays or Sundays and holidays. So I stayed in the Atlas, and I'd been there, I was there until I retired in 71. I was a clerk in the cutting department. I was in the office with a boss, and he had, at one time, he had 300 men under him. He had all the cutting departments. And uh, I used to weigh the work and, and tag the work, make out, type all the tickets for the work, and weigh the work. And uh, want me to tell you about the bad part? The bad part is we lost our pension. 
we lost our medical and we lost our life insurance. When they locked up three years ago, we lost everything. And not only me, but everybody else that worked there. So it was just a sad thing. And so many loyal employees, they had top mechanics in there. And uh, they had the best platers in the country. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Mr. Earhart, he's gone now. And he used to do the, all the plating, chrome, silver, and, and uh, used to come from everywhere in the country because Atlas did the best plate in the country. They had the best tack makers cut in there too, and everything. They had a lot of good mechanics in there, in the machine shop and everywhere. It was a crime that place went down, I'm telling you. During World War II, they employed about 700 people. Oh yeah, they had three shifts around the clock. They used to start at midnight Sunday and worked right up to on Saturday, you know. Yep, during the war, I worked 48 and 52 hours in there. It was, it was a great place to work before Mr. Lewis and Mr. Secor took it over. Mm -hmm. It was a great place. It was like a big family. We had some wonderful times in there, clam bakes, Christmas parties, outings, uh, fall dances, and everything. It, we were like one big family. Anybody had any hard luck, we'd all chip in and help until these fellows took it over and everything went down the drain. The floors at this level are warped from the leaking roof and sprinkled with thousands of shiny brass eyelets throughout. Also evident are these trails of burned paper that either eliminated the way of a trespasser in the night or the failed attempt of an arsonist. Fairhaven Fire Chief Donald R. Bernard. Well, a fully involved fire certainly would be a traumatic experience for our fire department and certainly overtax it. We're a small town, we're not a large city, and to experience a major fire at a complex such as the Atlas Tac Corporation would undoubtedly uh, put into operation immediately a mutual aid response which will uh, require the response of a number of communities. In other words, a major fire, I can see a commitment of at least 25 engine companies from surrounding towns along with 11 ladder companies and uh, uh, lesser amounts of rescue and water companies. The major um, problem we have with the Atlas Attack Corporation is in the fact that there is a lack of uh, water supply. In the town itself, we have three, millions of gal three million gallons of water above ground, but certainly uh, you don't use all of that water on a fire. So we would certainly be relying on opening main gates from New Bedford to feed into the system. We would also be looking in very heavily into the Acushionet River coming straight up South Street. These are the problems, and time is always working against you. It takes time to get engine uh, responses from surrounding co communities from as far away as Norton and uh, Freetown and, uh, of course, the, all the Dartmouth districts. They are, they are all included in, a, in a, um, a Bristol County task force plan, which is now being formulated. Uh, by our department with assignments for all the outlying uh, towns who would be assisting. It's certainly uh, not only the Atlas, once the Atlas were in full, uh, fully involved in fire, our concerns now have to be centered on the surrounding uh, salt marsh around there, which undoubtedly will spawn uh, new grass fires, uh, fly-in brands, and those are sparks uh, that you see flying in, in the course of a firestorm, uh, could rest on uh, rooftops of nearby buildings, which presents additional problems. So uh, we'll certainly, without question, have our hands full. In 1985, after much pressure from local and state officials, Atlas Tech began to remove toxic sludge from its lagoon in the back of the facility, which was used for a settling pond for industrial wastes, including cyanide. In 1986, a hearing was held at the State House in Boston. A report by State Representative John Bradford indicated the following. Two 55-gallon drums labeled cyanide were discovered here in the factory. There was major concern that the Rogers Elementary School across the street would be exposed to toxic fumes from a fire. Atlas Tack went unsecured for many months while vandals entered the building until Clean Harbors Company, under contract with the DEQE, agreed to post guards and seek reimbursement from Atlas Tack. The presence of highly toxic chemicals, including cyanide and naphtha, caused concern to the Fairhaven Fire Department because of the lack of proper equipment and manpower to fight or even control such a fire. 
A request was made on August 5, 1986 at the Selectman's meeting to increase police patrols and post security guards on the site. The Selectman said there was no extra money available for such security and that state reimbursement would be a problem. On Thursday, November 7, 1986, the last of the chemicals were removed. It is hard to comprehend that the dedication ceremonies in 1902 took place here in the shipping room where over 1,000 people, town officials, including Henry Huddleston Rogers himself, they all joined in celebration for this newly constructed modern factory, Atlas Tech, the oldest and largest manufacturers of tacks and nails in the world. Now. Only the sounds of the squeaking old and rusty roof vents pierce through the tranquil sounds of dripping water and passing winds. In the recreation hall, they tore that down, and that was a crime because the fellows that work there rebuilt that building. At one time they had filled it with the machinery and the floor had gone through and the fellows went in. The men stayed after work on Saturdays and Sundays and put a new floor in there and fixed it all up. It was beautiful the day we opened it. We bought the pool table from Colonel Queen's estate. It even had the chairs like um, ladder back chairs, you know, the high chairs that you watch the pool. The beautiful woodwork and that and everything. The pool table of the late Colonel Green was discovered here mostly intact, but badly decayed. However, it did reveal the beauty and splendor it once had. As the Atlas Tech continues to decay and its interior is constantly ransacked by vandals, the people of the town of Fairhaven fear for their children and their homes. The Fairhaven skyline reveals all the good and generosity of the late Henry Huddleston Rogers, but the towering smokestack of Atlas reminds us all of an industry that was kept alive to employ our families and now just a memory for former employees like Mary. I was a clerk in the cutting department. I was in the office with a boss and he had, at one time he had 300 men under him. He had all the cutting departments. And uh, I used to weigh the work and, and tag the work, make out, type all the tickets for the work and weigh the work. And uh, want me to tell you about the bad part? bad part is we lost our pension, we lost our medical, and we lost our life insurance. When they locked up three years ago, we lost everything. And not only me, but everybody else that worked there. So it's just a sad thing. And so many loyal employees, they had top mechanics in there. And uh, they had the best platers in the country. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Mr. Earhart, he's gone now. And he used to do the, all the plating, chrome, silver, and, and uh, used to come from everywhere in the country because Atlas did the best plating.